Bronchiolitis is an inflammation of the bronchioles, usually caused by a virus known as respiratory syncytial virus. This infection is most common in neonates and usually is a self-limiting infection. You need to differentiate between bronchiolitis, bronchitis, and asthma. Bronchiolitis is common in infants who are less than 2 years old, while asthma is more common in all the children. And lastly, bronchitis is an inflammation of the bronchi and affects all the people. The most common cause of bronchiolitis is a respiratory syncytial virus, followed by rhinovirus, parainfluenza virus, adenovirus, influenza virus, and coronavirus. When we look at the bronchioles, the bronchioles are small air was usually with less than 2 mm diameter and the normal bronchi has a smooth muscle cell around it. These muscle cells help in contracting and relaxation of the bronchioles. Inside the bronchioles, there are mucus producing cells known as goblet cells. And in the bronchial lining, we have a surfactant secreting clara cells. In about 1 to 3 days after the infection, there is a narrowing of airways due to excessive mucus secretion which occurs as a result of hyperproliferation of goblet cells. Cell wall thickening occurs and edema develops because of the excessive regeneration of epithelial cells and smooth muscle constricts narrowing the airway. The alveolar dead necrosis and viral invasion which causes edema leads to all this airway narrowing and constriction of the lumen. Air trapping occurs whereby the patient can inhale but they can't exhale all the inhaled air. Therefore there is a reduced ventilation and a ventilation perfusion mismatch which causes difficulty in breathing. When we look at the respiratory syncytial virus, this virus is actually the most common cause of bronchitis like we have said before. Then it is a single-stranded RNA virus. This virus is spread using airborne droplets and direct contact. Upon infection, the virus usually gets into the nasopharynx and in about 1-3 to three days it causes caro symptoms. Then after that, it migrates to the lower respiratory tract. Bronchiolitis can be classified into mild, moderate, and severe. In mild and moderate cases, the patient will present with achipnea, low-grade fever, nasal flaring, intercostal rhesus, inspiratory crepitation or auscultation, and a wheeze. But in severe cases, the patient will present severely ill with an increased or a reduced respiratory rate, apnea, severe grunting, cyanosis, and a difficulty in feeding where the child cannot take more than 50% of the presented feed. The risk factors associated with the development of bronchiolitis are an infant who is less than 6 weeks old, a premature infant, congenital heart diseases such as pulmonary hypertension, immunodeficiencies, neurological disorders, and chronic respiratory illnesses. The diagnosis for bronchiolitis is a clinical diagnosis by physical examination and then history taking. When examining these patients, they will present with upper respiratory symptoms such as cough, crepitations, wheeze. Bronchiolitis treatment is supportive with administration of oxygen and hydration. When treating these patients, the treatment is also classified as per the severity of the infection. Mild cases are usually self-limiting and can be managed as an outpatient with oral hydration and there is no use of bronchodilators or corticosteroids. In moderate cases, you may need to admit the patient and administer antipyretics such as paracetamol. You need to maintain oxygen above 92% saturation with either use of a face mask or a high flow nasal catheter. Oral hydration is, should be encouraged. And if the patient cannot take oral fluids, you can administer them using a nasogastric feeding. There is also no need of use of corticosteroids or bronchodilators. 
In severe cases, these patients will need to be admitted and oxygen saturation be maintained above 92% using a high flow oxygen nasocatheters. A continuous positive airway pressure may be also needed. You need to secure an intravenous access for administration of intravenous fluids and a nasogastric tube should be used in feeding. In very severe cases, an ICU care might be needed.